Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on while loops. I just want to remind you that a while loop is a control structure that repeats code that belongs to it. And a while loop is another type of loop that rather than repeats code for a member of a group, repeats code while a condition is true. This is the syntax of a while loop. So while some condition or predicate is true, it repeats some code. And here's an example. So if I walk through this code and I start x is 0, uh, 0 is less than 10, so this code executes. Then it sets x equal to 1 and repeats that. If I let this code run till its execution, what will I find that the value of x is? 10. 10 brains. It's 10. Good job, guys. If I set x equal to 0 in this example and while on a tautology, what can we expect to happen? We end up an infinite loop. An infinite loop. That's, that's a good way of putting it. So let's just check, check what this does in, in the interpreter. right? If I say while true, I say print x. Let's make this a bit bigger. Yeah, 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 OK. I have to program properly. Uh, x is 0. I'll say while true, while true. Uh, print x, and then increment x by 1. So like this is working as intended, right? It's, it's looping. The condition true is never going to fail. It's a tautology. Um, so this is what we call an infinite loop. <clears throat> when you work with while loops, you will definitely produce one by accident. So in, what do you do in this case? Well, for me, since I'm working on the console, I can hit Control C for cancel, and that will end the loop. Um, in whatever IDE you're working with, before you start playing with while loops, I want you to figure out what the command is to end an infinite loop. Right? There should be something like a break. Um, there should be some keystroke like escape or Control C. It's Operating system and IDE dependent, so please figure out what it is. If all else fails, so who has a Windows machine? Okay, so you guys can control alt delete into the task manager, and then you may see some type of Python code that, that's uh, occupying all of your uh, processor, and then you can just kill it. For those using Macs, who's using Macs? All right, uh, option, commit, oh, just let me run, I'll run my infinite loop again. Uh, no, I won't. Um, if you hit Option, Command, Escape, this will appear, and you can force quit terminal from here, right? If Python ever really carks it and is taking control of your computer. And as always, uh, those using Linux get no instructions. Um, so this is going to enter an infinite loop. So the point of this slide is please go figure out how to break out of an infinite loop before you produce one by accident. A uh, similar type of while loop, instead of using a tautology, I'm going to use a contradiction. So what gets printed and what is the value of x after this loop terminates? OK, but what's the, what's the answer to the first part of my question? What's get, what gets printed? Nothing gets printed. Nothing gets printed, and x has the value of 0 when the loop stops. Right. So. The point of this slide is the code of a while loop does not necessarily get executed at all. Right? If the condition for the while loop is never satisfied to begin with, we're going to skip the code entirely. Right? So just be mindful of that. That code inside a while, while loop doesn't get executed necessarily. I was really hoping one of you were going to ask me a question about this. OK, I'll ask the question. But sir, in other languages, we have like repeats. That, we can uh, have a type of while loop where the code exe uh, executes at least once. Uh, but we'll get to that. The answer is we don't have that structure in Python, but we'll get to it. So how can I, I was thinking a lot about this the other day, about how I could motivate while loops. Because it's typically the case that for loops are sufficient, right? That you know how many times you're going to have to repeat something. So I really had to figure out some way of coming up with an example where we'd have to do something an indeterminable, indetermined amount of times. So the two that I came up with are prompting the user to do something and playing a random game. 
So let me do the first one first. Uh, let's put that there. Let's. I have to make. Can you see everything that's up there? None of it's cut off. Uh, touch Tuesday. So why wouldn't we be able to? So I want to write a piece of code. Uh, and all this piece of code is going to do is repeatedly prompt the user to enter the number 7. Uh, so I'm going to say x is input, uh, enter the number 7. And then I'm just going to cast x to an integer, because when you input something, it's actually a string. OK, so I want to put this in some type of loop. So I'll just put a while there for the time being. Uh, so uh, while x is not equal to 7, I want to ask the user to input 7. Uh, and if x is not equal to 7, print uh, no, enter 7. OK, so I'm just going to run this. Enter 7. 9. No, enter 7. 10. No, enter 7. Paul. Oh, I can't cast Paul. Whoops. Uh, 6. 1. 4. 77. 7. Hooray, we did it. OK. Fairly simple piece of code. Um, why would a for loop not work here? Yeah, this could be like the world's stupidest person, right? Like this person could enter six forever, essentially. So the problem is we don't, like we have no definite amount of steps to take uh, before the user does what we want, right? So we just have to say, okay, while the person's being stupid, continue looping, right? So. This is one motivational example for using a while loop. More interesting, I think, um, for practice, for understanding while loops, and for learning some mathematics, is playing a random game. Right? Playing what is uh, what we call a stochastic process. That's the fancy word for a random game. Stochastic is just a random. Uh, stochastic is just a fancy word for random. Uh, that's the first line of my book on stochastic processes. If you'd like to purchase it. I think you actually get it for free from the, you can download it online from the library for free because the university has some deal with Springer where you can get all the books. But if you want to learn a little bit of programming and a little bit about stochastic processes, you can check out my book. Um, okay, so we just did this one, but I want to, I want to now write a program which involves random numbers. And because I want to use random numbers, I'm going to have to show you a cascade of other things because random numbers aren't built in by the system. So we're going to have to call in a library, which means I'm also going to have to show you how to call in a library. So I'm sure many of you may have already called in a library uh, just during practice, but officially we have not given you this ability. So now I am giving it to you guys. So if you want to use a single command from an external library, you can import it to Python to make it available as if it were a built-in like this. Right? So in this case, uh, me, the user, wants to use a function called random integer, which belongs to the library random. So I just say, from the random library, import me the random integer command. And this gives me the ability to generate a random integer between 1 and 6 uh, uniformly, which means that the numbers, this is like a dice roll. Right, each number 1 through 6 has, has a 1 in 6 chance of occurring. Right? Any type of distribution which is generating random numbers uh, with equal probability is called uniform. Um, I don't like doing it this way. This is, this is the way that I prefer doing it. So, Rather than just importing a single command, you can import the whole library essentially. All, you, you can make the whole library available to you right? just by saying import random. And then you say, I would like to use the random integer function from the random library. So you say random dot random integer and give me a number between 1 and 6. 
All right, so I'm going to be doing the second type, although the first type is equivalent somehow. I just like the second type because it's telling you explicitly that you're like calling a library command, right? Which tells the user, okay, I better have this library installed and called. Okay, so now that it, <laughs> random numbers are actually something that's like very, very complicated. You can take a whole course in random number generation. It's not actually possible to generate random numbers with a computer, with software, right? The best we can do is generate pseudo random numbers. Um, and I'll show you what the consequence of that is in a bit. Um, so the numbers that you generate using a computer, not random. If you allow me to build a piece of hardware, then I can generate random numbers. So you guys took physics, chemistry back in high school. Do you guys know what the double slit experiment is? Okay, so it turns out if you like take a thin piece of paper and you cut two slits in it and you fire an electron down the middle of those two slits, that nature somehow is going to pick one of the slits to send the electron through. And nature picks randomly. So if you let me build this box and hook it into a computer, I could generate truly random bits. But we're not going to do that. Um, I think you can, you can like buy a USB device which does this, but pseudo, pseudo random numbers are more than sufficient for our needs. Uh, because they're not truly random, there is a consequence of this which bothered my other class, but we'll, we'll, let's see how you cope <laughs> with, with this new knowledge. There is a function from the random library called random seed. And some random seed gets set by the computer uh, when you start using random numbers. It usually seeds it with the computer's time or the date or something, something that's dynamic. You, the user, can set a seed. So I'm going to tell the random, right? So the seed, basically, there's some machine which is generating random numbers. And I can just sort of say, uh, machine, you should start with, like, you should be in the one state. And the consequence of that is, is this, right? So if I say random.seed, and I give it the number one, you can give it anything, right? 17, your name, right, the date. And I generate a random integer between 1 and 10,000. It'll say... 2,202, I can generate another one that's going to be 9,326. Okay, so I've generated two random numbers between 1 and 10,000. I'm going to now tell the computer again, okay, seed, right? I want you to seed with 1, and I'm going to ask for a random integer between 1 and 10,000. It's going to say 2,202. I'm going to ask for a random integer between 1 and 10,000. It's going to give me 9,326. Right? The range of numbers in this case are so huge that the fact that I've generated the same two numbers in the same order, that happening by accident is extremely improbable. Right? In fact, I could do, I could do 10 or I can do, do 100 random numbers if, if you'd like, just, just so we can push the probability truly to zero. Okay. So this is the thing that bothered my other class. The numbers in the sequence are independently random. Right? If I were to generate keep generating numbers, these numbers are appearing randomly. The sequences that you've generated aren't random. They're dependent on the seed. Right? So you're generating random numbers, but the same random numbers. I know this is sort of a mind screw. <coughs> but again, the individual generations in the sequence are independently random, but the sequences aren't. They're dependent on the seed. This is actually desirable. Does anyone have any idea why this would be desirable? Right? Debugging. debugging. Could you imagine trying to debug a piece of code where every time you've run your code, it's giving your code different input? That would be a disaster. Right? When you're programming using random numbers, you definitely want to use a seed. So you're using the same random, same random numbers each time you run the code. And then at the very end, you can remove it. <clears throat> so again, like if we were security experts and we were generating, um, so I'm sure the people in security aren't using Python's built-in uh, random number generator to generate random numbers. Right? They have some sort of their own methods, but random number generation is, is very interesting if you ever want to uh, study it. It's called, so these numbers, numbers that aren't truly random, that are like can be seeded in this manner, are called pseudo-random numbers. Okay, so now that we have the capacity, yes. Um, if I set the seed to something with an absolute like can, um, 
like a tangent function, is it possible to get like a zero division error randomly, or will it just skip to the next one? I don't understand. Like the seed. Like if, if the seed is like the tangent of a number. Sure. Like and the. But like I can, I can give seed like basically anything. Uh, Like you want me to give this infinity? I don't think seed's doing what you think it's doing, right? It's just like a random bit sequence that ran like the random number generation is going to use. Like the fact that I gave it one it has no mathematical significance, right? You like there are random number generators where you can seed it by like moving your mouse around a bunch, right? It it, it just wants some something to to start with some type of like random catalyst, if you will. But that catalyst has like has no mathematical properties, right? They just want you to say, okay, give me Billy should give me a different seed than Sally, right? So it's usually the time of the the clock the clock on the computer is what it's giving it a seed. I saw a second question up there. No, okay, so watch. Um, Okay, so I'm going to random seed this with my name, right? And then I can random, I can generate a random int uh, between 1 and 100, let's say. And then I can random seed it again. And okay. What you're seeding with has no mathematical property, right? It's, you give it, it's, it's just... I don't even know how to, it's just something that you use to catalyze the random number generator. If I use Paul Verbic and you use your name, you're going to get the same, right? But anyways, yeah. I just used one because it's like the first whole number, right? Nothing else besides that. Okay, next year I'm going to use like hello world just to really make sure that there's a distinction here. Okay, so how much time do I got? Oh, perfect. Okay, so now we have a random number generator. So... I want to write a piece of code that has the computer like print out dice rolls until it rolls a uh, six. Why couldn't we use a for loop for this question? Someone from the back. Anyone from the back want to participate? Why can't I use a for loop to, yeah. Uh, can I rephrase your answer? <laughs> yeah, the, um, are you saying that it's because a six may never be rolled? Yes, right? We don't know if a 6 will ever be rolled. Like, or you can't tell me how many rolls the computer is going to require to generate that 6. You could tell me the expected number of rolls, but that's non-deterministic. So I need a while loop, right? So that's all I'm trying to say. Like, this is an instance where you do need a while loop rather than a for loop. So let's, let's try coding this. Uh, what did I call it? Game 1? OK. So let's call this game 1. And I'm going to be lazy with my doc strings today <coughs> for good reason. <coughs> Return the number of rolls required. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Still yellow? Well, there's nothing I can do about that, guys. Just imagine like this is like Instagram and I've just put some like hip filter over the lecture, right? It's still legible. You can still read the words. Okay, so we'll be fine, guys. Okay, so um, I want to uh, roll and print results of six-sided dice rolls until a six is rolled and return the number of rules. OK. What do I put here now? Like, how do I write a doc string example for something with, gen with random number generation? Could it do anything with what I just showed you with seed? Um, 
Well, I'm, I'm going to random seed it, right? Because then I know exactly what random numbers are going to be generated, which means I can write in an answer here, right? So if I go into here and I random seed this, yep. No, but like we're inputting it. That, that's the point, right? So if we all agree to use the seed one, then we're all going to get the same random numbers. I don't know, okay, who, has, who is Python shell running? Okay, follow, follow me here and tell me if you guys are getting the same random numbers, right? Rand int one and six. So I'm, that's a two, so how many, five, one, three, one, oh my god, four, 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 six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so this should be nine. Maybe we won't print. Um, but you see what I did there, right? I can actually give like what the correct result of the game should be if you first allow me to seed your computer with. So what did you figure out? And you random seeded with one? Hmm, okay, so this may be machine independent. I'm gonna, or perhaps it's architecture dependent. Who has a Mac? Can you give it a try? Okay, so maybe this is machine, it's, this may be machine dependent, archi archi architecture dependent, or even uh, version dependent. Okay, so it is at least the case that on your own machine that you can generate the same random numbers, yeah. You got the same as me? What do you get? Okay, now this is actually something that is bu bugging me. Okay, so you're getting the same as me? I'm using 3.7. What are you using? 3.7? 3.7? You say 3.1? And you didn't get the same numbers. You, okay, so this is a version thing. So all of you on the correct version is me. We'll be getting A pluses. And the rest of you who are not, get out of my lecture hall. Okay, so provided, provided everyone's on the same version, uh, seeds work li like this. So anyways, let's write this game now. right? So I want to I wanna roll a dice between 1 and 6. So maybe I'll write a piece of code that does that. Uh, dice, or roll dice. This is going to return an integer. This is just going to be rolls a six-sided dice. And this is just going to return, I better import random, uh, random dot random integer between one and six. Okay, so I want to roll and print the results of a six-sided dice roll until a six is rolled. Uh, okay, while roll dice, uh, is not equal to six. Uh, well, continue, right? Uh, return. Oh no! Wait, I have to accumulate something. The answer is zero. Wall roll dice is not equal to six. Accumulate on answer, and then return the answer. Okay. Do we see how this would work? Right. So, roll dice is going to call out and roll a roll a dice. If that dice roll happens to be six. This is going to fail, and we're going to return the answer. If I roll a dice and it's not equal to 6, then it's going to increment answer by 1. Right? Or maybe I can make this more clear. Number of rolls. Okay. All right, so let's see if this works. Yes. You're right, I should, that's a good point, that's a good edge case. Did, did everyone hear the mistake that I had made? Well, I should have started number of rolls with one, because if I rolled six on the first try, then I would have returned zero, and that would have been not, that would have been wrong, right? So I should have started a uh, number of rolls with one, that's a good catch. Okay, so game one, uh, let's see, three, 10, right? So I'm just playing independent games here, and it's saying, okay, and the first time it took me three rolls to roll a six, then it took me 10 rolls, then four, then 12, then two, right? Seems to be working. 
There's a keyword here that's useful sometimes, and that's the break keyword. What a break does is it allows you to exit a loop at any point in the loop's execution. Breaks also work in for loops. We just use them less there, right? Because it'd be weird to stop a for loop before it finishes its iterator. So given that a break stops the, term, stops the execution of a while loop, what will this piece of code print? So while true, so that means it definitely goes into the loop. Right, so let's just do this line by line. While true, okay, that means I go into here, print hello, okay, so I'm going to print hello, break. Oh, okay, so stop the loop immediately. So then that will just exit. So this will print hello only, right? Because it, it broke before it got to world. Right? So we, we can exit a loop, right, even in the middle of the code execution. Now this is the thing I was mentioning before, how I was surprised that none of you complained when I was talking about how while loops, the code of a while loop doesn't necessarily execute uh, because there's another mm, sort of flavor of while loops found in other languages. It's called the do while or the repeat until. C has this, Pascal has this, um, and although Python doesn't natively have this, we can simulate it somehow, right? So a do while loop would have syntax like this. You say, do this code while this condition is true, right? Rather than the while loop we have been using, which has been while condition is true, do this, right? On the, so for the while condition do this, no code is executed necessarily, but conversely with the do this while, the code gets executed at least once, right? Because the condition doesn't get checked to the end of the code. So, this is how you can simulate a do while in Python using the break statement, right? You just say, um, so I usually write while true, but other Python programmers prefer while one. Pick which one you like. I prefer true somehow. It makes it more clear. Um, so this basically puts the condition of breaking at the end of the code, right? It says if x is greater than zero, then break, right? So this is how you would simulate a do while loop. Um, if you really want to compactify it more, you can write a statement like this, right? Uh, break if x is greater than zero, else continue. Now, I really don't understand how to describe what continue does. It's the opposite of break. It, it just says, like, carry on, like, continue just like, keep doing what you've been doing, right? Just, good job, Python, right? Like, keep going forward. Um, we need continue for conditions like this, because an inline if statement requires an else, right? So if I want to if break, I need, I, need so, I need the opposite of break for this, and the opposite of break is continue, right? So continue basically just tells your code to continue. Uh, I think we just did this, actually. So maybe you guys can try this one. This one stops once a one is rolled. That's, I, I have a better question than this to give you. Um, so if I don't get to it, I want maybe for the lab, I'll add this to the lab or when you go home, just try playing around with games with random number generators. Um, like maybe write a piece of code that asks, okay, I, this is actually one of your lab questions, but I can phrase it differently. Write a, write a piece of code which flips a coin. And then write a piece of code that says, how many coin flips do I need to get like 15 consecutive heads? Right? That, that would be quite many flips I would expect. Right? So th there's a lab question that's similar to this. OK, um, this, is, this is very typical in midterms in finals. So perk up a bit. Right? Uh, you can convert any for loop into a while loop. The opposite isn't true. Why isn't the opposite true? Why can't I convert every while loop to a for loop? Yeah. I just gave you four examples where a for loop was insufficient. And any of the examples I used today 
is a reason that like whiles can't be converted to fours. The opposite is true. So here's a question. Write the following for loop as a while loop. So I'm just going to go over here. Uh, I'm just going to clear this out. So we have this for loop. 4x in a, b, c, d, e, f. I want to print x. How can I write this as a while loop now? OK. So this, the while loop is going to be less compact and elegant than the for loop. I wouldn't recommend using while loops when a for loop would suffice, right? Especially because in Python we have this very nice um, syntax. But in any case, I'm going to need some index. I'm going to set that index to 0. I'm going to say while my index is less than the length a, b, c, d, e, f, x is. Uh, is less than the length of x's strictly, right? Because remember, we index from 0. I can say print uh, x's at this index, and then I can increment the index. Does everyone see how that would work? It's a fairly simple piece of code. Let's see if it does work. That will create a new line just so our prints are separated. Yep, it works. Right? Um, so you should practice as much as you can converting some of, I think, do the lab this week. In the lab this week, there's a lot of convert these fours to whiles. And I can almost guarantee you there'll be a question like that in your midterm and final, if not both. Right? When is your final, by the way? Is it November? October? It's soon, isn't it? Uh, let's see. Anyway, we'll find out later, but because um, I want to give you guys tips about writing exams before you take it, because um, I have a lot of strategies that you can use. We can't do that one yet. We've done that one. How much time do we got? Um, let's write this function, and then I'll let you guys go. Um, let's play a guessing game, right? So I want to build a game where the user is prompted to guess a number that the computer has randomly selected. I'm not going to write a doc string because I'm lazy. Uh, foo. Okay. And it's going to return nothing because okay? it's just a procedure. So, um, so I want to run a game and I want to get an input from the user, right? G guess a number. Guess the number, right? And then I have to cast that to an integer. So what should the secret number be? Secret number. Let's uh, pick a random integer between 1 and, I don't know, 1,000. OK. While. While x is not equal to the secret number, right? So while my guess is wrong, I want to prompt the, prompt the user to make a guess, right? So this may be mysterious, right? But I know that the random integer, that we're guessing positive numbers, right? So if I set my first initial guess to be minus 1, that's guaranteed to be wrong, right? So that, that's why I set it to minus 1. So while x is not equal to the secret number, guess the number. And then if this loop escapes, this means that x is equal to the secret number. Right? We're guaranteed x is equal to the secret number. Print. You win. Nothing. Okay. And then return none. OK, so let's try playing this game. All right. Five. Five. If you're right, you'll get an A+. Plus. Oh, I didn't give any prompting. Sorry. Uh, uh, where should I prompt? Uh, boo earns. OK, well, this it's, game's not going to be as well executed as I can. So if x is less than the secret number, what I want to print. Uh, too small. Yep. Too big. 
try again. Yeah, I know, I, I know. It's going to screw up. Uh, okay, so you said five, too small. Huh? Can, can you guys figure out a better gambling strategy than this? Don't ever take him to the casino, right? No, no, no. This is five thousand is o over the threshold. I've generated a random number between one and one thousand, or is this ten thousand? Okay, five thousand is fine. Five thousand is the perfect guess, <laughs> but still too small. Okay, because there's a lesson I want to teach you here about searching for numbers, right? If we're if we're searching between one and ten thousand. 5,000 is a great first guess. Why? Because it cut the, the search space into two halves. And we're going to isolate which half we have to look in. So given that 5,000 is too small, the number we're searching for is between 5 and 10,000. So what should the next guess be? Too big. 420, right? <laughs> Someone did say that in the other class, and I said, can't you wait till Wednesday? Right. 250. <laughs> I'll take one dollar, Bob. Uh, what? You may go. I want you to think about this betting strategy, though, because this notion of dividing a search space into halves. This is divide and conquer, and this is very important as a computer science notion. Right? Oh.